So we're now recording, Lindsay. Awesome, thanks so much, Sam. And thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about file naming conventions. Um, if you thought this was something else, now is the time where you can you know, quietly exit the room and no one will notice. Nope. All right, so as Sam said, my name is Lindsay Guypen. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I am the data services librarian here at University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, I'm also the liaison for teacher education and higher education, educational leadership and cultural foundations and educational research methodology. So if you are in one of those programs, I would love to hear from you at some point. Um, so this is kind of why we're here. You probably saw the title for the presentation, like Sam mentioned, looked kind of like this. Um, we are all guilty of having disastrous file names on our computer somewhere. Um, in fact, I'm really hoping that I don't accidentally show you the desktop of my screen um, because while I can talk about file naming and organization of files and I tend to do a, a pretty good job most of the time, um, I'm not perfect always and my desktop is a disaster right now um, because that's just life. So this is the dilemma. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that you feel seen, Paul. Um, and I think that we have mostly faculty here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. This was for any students who might've attended. But since we have mostly faculty, your files might look a little more like this um, than the last one. But yeah, we all do this like, okay, I made my syllabus and I'm gonna save it. And then, oh, I need to make a change. So, all right, I'll just, I'll call it final. Um, okay, uh, you know, I made another ch change. So, um, actual final and then we have revised final and then okay I need to start over so we're going to start with second this time and then let's say a month goes by or five years or even five minutes and you go back to your folder and you look and you're going I have no idea which one of these I need to use or which is the most updated version so that's what we're here to talk about and go over a couple of strategies um, they're going to seem really straightforward once you know them um, and yeah, hopefully they'll make your lives a little more organized and uh, easier to manage. I'm just going to check the comments real quick. Yes, exactly. <laughs> cool. Okay, so first thing, I like to call these recommended practices rather than best practices. Um, like I said, we are all here living our best lives and doing our best, and we might be bringing our best every day, but when we're doing file names, um, we're doing the recommended. And we're not always gonna be at our best. Somebody said that the other day in a presentation and it really resonated with me that it's a pandemic. I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna do my best, but it's really like recommended practices rather than best practices. So first thing, um, establish your conventions before you get started. Once you have a folder with a bunch of stuff in it, it's really hard to go back and start organizing it. So spend some time looking at what you're gonna be collecting and what you're gonna be organizing before you start adding files and that will really help you out. I do have a tool at the end of the presentation um, that you can use to sort of think about file naming um, when you're beginning a project. Second, be consistent. Um, stick with whatever plan that you had and keep going with it. Um, your file name should be 25 characters or shorter. Why? Well, 25 names is going to be easier, or 25 names, 25 characters is going to be easier to read. But also, um, some programs can't, like, won't let you use more than 25 characters. So if you go beyond that, you're kind of treading um, some rough water and you, and you might get yourself into trouble. Also, I learned recently that um, Microsoft, or not Microsoft, Windows, has like a file path length limit. So if you have a lot of really long folder names and file names, eventually you're gonna run out of space. So 25 gives you enough room um, to be clear and concise and detailed, but also keep it short. Um, also, you're gonna start with more general information and you're gonna move to more specific information. So we'll start looking at this. Um, abbreviate when you can, like I said, 25 characters or shorter, you don't want to write out the whole university name, just write out UNCG. And then if you need to use people's names, start with their family name or uh, last name, and then their first name. 
All right, this is like my favorite thing. It makes me feel like the nerdiest. Um, date format should be in ISO 8601. And I did pick today for this webinar because of the date. Today is 2-22-22. Um, and as much as I wanted to just write 2 22 um, in my presentation, that is not the format that we should be using. So there is an international organization of standards and they have a date standard. It's called 80, uh, ISO 8601. File that away later for trivia. It may come up someday, um, but this is what it looks like. Um, it's the year, the four digit year, the two digit month and the two digit day. So today would be 2022. 0221. Um, you're probably not going to need to include um, hours, minutes, and seconds, but if you do for some reason, I don't know, maybe somebody in the, in the hard sciences really needs the hours, the minutes, and the seconds, you just follow that along. There's an example on the bottom. Um, the cool thing that this does is it will put the most recent file at the top of your list. So I used to run a monthly department meeting at my previous job. Um, and then in the pandemic, we started having biweekly meetings because, you know, it was the pandemic and we needed to talk more to make sure we were all on the same page. But um, this, this folder just got out of, out of hand. So when I started using this date convention um, with the four digit year, the two digit month and the two digit day, it made everything go in order. And it was really easy to open the folder, find the last meeting at the top, open it up, see, you know, whatever unfinished business we had and then move on to the next meeting. So that's super duper helpful. Um, and then to sort of make your file name more readable, um, use capitals and underscores, but avoid special characters and spaces. The special characters is because again, a lot of programs aren't gonna be able to read every single special program or a special character. And the spaces is the same reason, just some programs don't allow spaces. So if you just don't use them, you're gonna be golden with your, with your file names. Um, so there's a couple examples below. The date convention goes at the beginning. And then if you've never heard of it before, it's called camel case. Um, that's when, if you eliminate the spaces, you're capitalizing the first letter of every word. And it's, it's called camel case. It's sort of like the humps in a camel's back. Um, and if you prefer to use underscores, you can just keep in mind that that adds to your characters and it's a little harder to keep it under 25. All right, next thing is versions. Um, a lot of times you don't need a version, but if it's if it's something like a syllabus <clears throat> or, you know, your promotion and tenure packet or, or something that you're going to have different versions of, you probably want to have a version at the end. Um, so there's an example file name at the bottom that has a version. Now it says that you should do a version and then a two digit number. Um, the reason for that is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but computers don't read numbers the same way we do. So if you have, let's say 13 versions of something and you only use one digit, like you have V1, um, and then you go, when you get to 11, it's V11, your computer will read that um, V1, V11, V12, V13, V2, V3, V4, V5, which can be really confusing. If you pad those versions with extra zeros, you know, the number that you think you might need or maybe one, one um, decimal point more, um, one digit more, you're gonna be okay. So for example, I'm probably not gonna have 10 file naming presentations, I hope, 10 versions of it, um, but I still did V01. Um, just because if you know you're going to have, you know, 50 versions of something, I, I, I would really love to talk to you about that because that's a lot of versions. Um, but if you, if you think whatever it is that you're working on, if you think that you're going to have more than 99 where you might, then you might need a couple of zeros. But I feel like probably in most cases, you just need the, the two digits. So yeah, Joe used to work at the EPA and they wrote, I have written sample 00002 on a test two before. Yeah, that's the cases where you, where you might need it. All right, next thing. So this is, we're getting kind of into talking about organizing um, files within folders. 
Um, something that you can do as a favor to yourself or whoever else might be looking at your files down the line is to include um, something called a README. You've probably seen a README before. If you've downloaded software from the internet, a lot of times it comes in a folder with a README file. Um, a README is usually a text file, and that's just because it can be opened on any computer. It has no um, it has no formatting, so and it's just going to be directions. So if you download software, it's just like this is what the software is, this is how you install it, this is what the license is, this is the version number, and this is who you can call if you need help. Um, by making yourself a README about your files, you're giving yourself directions on, okay, these are the, the naming conventions that I used. This is why, um, and this is the organizational structure that I used, and this is why. So you're kind of giving yourself some directions so that if you look back at something a few years later, you can look, you can read it and say, okay, all right, that's what this means. Um, you can also use it to document the structure of folders. So like I said, we're moving kind of into file organization. Um, so for file organization, it's the same as your naming conventions, just have a system and be consistent with that system. So when you are thinking about establishing that system, you wanna consider how am I gonna be looking for this information later? Um, and then you wanna plan out the folder hierarchy before the project begins. Again, there's a tool at the end that can help you if you're starting a large project um, to organize to organize these things and to sort of think these through. So here's kind of an example. Um, let's say I'm working on a project and we're taking data from Charlotte and Greensboro. We did it in 2022 and in 2021. So you can see I have my project. I have a folder for Charlotte. I have a folder for Greensboro. Um, within those, I have folders for the years and within those are my documents. Now, why did I start with Charlotte in, or I'm sorry, the cities, Charlotte and Greensboro, instead of 22 and 2021. Well, that's how I think I'm gonna access the information later. I think I'm gonna think city, and then I'm gonna think year. I don't think I'm gonna be looking for the year and then the city. That's why I picked this organization. So it's really about how are you gonna be looking for this later on? Um, and then here are some things to think about um, when you are considering organizing your folders. Um, we work at a university, so you know maybe we've worked at another university, so you might want to include the school, but certainly like the class, or um, maybe you do a lot with different years of, of students, so class of 2022, class of 2023. Um, if you're in the hard sciences, it might be the instruments that you're using, um, geographic location, or it could be the team member. This is really gonna be dependent on you and your work. Um, and since this is an, a very interdisciplinary webinar, it's kind of hard to have everything there, but there's some ideas to sort of get you thinking a little bit. And then here are our additional resources. Like I mentioned, this is a worksheet on file naming conventions. It can be really useful. If it's a small project that you're working on, this is probably gonna be overkill. But if you're starting like a grant funded research project, um, this is a great tool to use. It was developed by another data librarian at another institution. Um, and then this is just a different, it's a website with information on, on these topics. If you kind of want to look at it later or share with your classes or, you know, just go at your own pace. And then of course we have our UNC G data services research guide. And that is it. So are there any questions? Do you want to drop a link to the slides in the chat? Yes, I didn't publish them. So give me just a second. Yeah, no rush. And if anyone has any questions while Lindsay is doing that, uh, feel free. So Paul asks, any tips for developing a system for group or collabor collaborative projects? Um. Not offhand. I, I think I talked with my partner about this because they work on collaborative research projects. I think that I would get the 
the um, the link to the worksheet and I would go through it with my team members um, and, and then take data from that to see how everybody thinks that they're going to be looking at the information. And I, I know that that's asked, like that's spending a lot of time at the front end, planning out what you're going to do, but it's just like anything else. It's like doing your research or writing your research paper. <clears throat> the more planning and organization you do at the, at the beginning, um, the less headache you're going to have at the end. So that's probably what I would do. Um, and then I, there might be some specific um, things for collaborative works. Um, I like feel like I came across some stuff when I was researching. So um, was that Paul? Yeah, Paul, I'm gonna write your name down. And if I, if I stumble on it again, I will send it to you. And some people are putting some advice in the chat too. Cool. Um, Joe said, uh, and document everything. I love the idea of a group worksheet better than spending even more at the end midway though. And Chad said advice when working with shared files, sharing files back and forth. I'm also interested in tips for managing files across multiple platforms, Google Drive, my docs folder, Office, share drive. Sorry, that's a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I meant to say that um, if you, I don't know if anybody noticed, but there are proprietary softwares and there are non-proprietary softwares. So especially if you're working with a large group of collaborators, but really anytime, try to save things in the non-proprietary file format um, when you can. So instead of using you know, an Excel file, save your data as a .csv. And it depends really on what your research is, what that's going to be. Um, but that's that's why the readmes are in the txt files. It's not so that you open it and it's really hard to read because you know there's no formatting and it goes all the way across your screen. It's because then anybody can open it on any computer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my recommendation there is to try and use the non-proprietary tools. Um, Google Docs is free. Um, and it is designed for collaboration. So if I was working on a Word document um, or even collecting data, that's probably where I would do it collaboratively. Um, but then at the end of my project, when I saved it, I would probably save the, um, I would save the Google Docs files, but I would also save a CSV, if it, especially if it was an Excel and probably a TXT for the, for the doc. I mean, I, I don't think dot .doc is going to go away anytime soon. You can access that doc um, through through Google Docs for free. Um, but yeah, I would just make sure to save multiple copies um, and use the non-proprietary softwares. Mine is a follow-up, I guess, to that kind of suggestion for working with shared files back and forth across multiple platforms. So like one thing we struggled with was we had paper lab notebooks, we had um, different computers that weren't connected to the internet, we had Google Drive, or I guess Box um, at the EPA or a version of that. And so, you know, if one lab tech takes file A, renames it or, or makes a new version of it, that's, you know, version two, but then you've got lab tech B in the other room doing the same thing to the same file. So now we have two version twos, but they're made by different people. It's like, how do you track that kind of provenance of where that file went um, and who edited it? So do you have any recommendations for, I guess, you know, is that information best stored in a file name or would you have a file name that is like 20 billion characters long? <laughs> um, so I do think versioning would help. Um, I, I hate the answer that I'm about to give you, but I think that that is why tools like GitHub exist um, because GitHub is specifically a versioning, it's a free software tool that is a versioning tool. So what you can do is you go to the GitHub server and you download you know, the data set or the file or whatever it is that you're working on and you make your changes, code, there's a lot of code on GitHub. You make your changes and then you, on your personal machine and then you submit it back to, back to GitHub and then someone is managing that repository and they have to approve those changes. And that way, <clears throat> excuse me, if say Joe and I are both working on the file um, at the same time and we both have changes and let's say Sam is the person who's overseeing the GitHub repository, um, Sam will see both of those sets of changes come through and we'll be able to, to merge them together into like into a new version that includes both changes. Or if we changed, the same thing two different ways she can say to us hey you have different opinions and you need to figure it out 
I GitHub is a great tool. Every time I try to like push documents from my computer to GitHub, it's like I'm pulling my hair out. Um, I just I don't use it enough to be super comfortable with it, but it is a really good tool. Are there any other um, questions? I dropped an assessment in the chat. I dropped a link to where these webinars live, but you'll also get this link again um, in the email. I will, let me open up the slides right now and I will include the slides in the email, which has the links to a lot of the tools that Lindsay was discussing. Um, yeah, Chad asked a question. Did you say including the date in the file name is a recommended practice? I've wondered about this since there is a date modified in the file details. Yes, but I would say if you're accessing it from Microsoft Word and it's really easy for you to see the date and time, um, it's it's for you, right, or your team. So if you think it's overkill and you don't want to include it, that's fine. I personally like the date and the version feels like a lot. So I usually I put the dates. Um, versions might work better for you. Great. I am going to like, you know, now try to practice this and be a, a better, better librarian listening to my colleagues. Um, are there any final questions? I know everyone's very busy at this time of year. On two, 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 zero, two, two, but I'd have to reverse it, right? Yeah. Two, oh, two, two, oh, two, two, two. two. Only for your file name. Okay. You could probably just say two, two, Not two. for life. Two, two. Also, I'm from Denver and it is two degrees there today. Oh, well, there you go. Um, Which sounds terrible also. Yeah. Um, I love it. I love all the numbers. Um, I got to source some 22 um, sunglasses. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, be on the lookout for the email with all this stuff. Thank you, Lindsay, for hosting. Um, if you have any data questions at UNCG, uh, feel free to reach out to Lindsay uh, moving forward. You can also uh, reach out to your liaison librarian and they can connect you with Lindsay as well. Um, but if that is it, um, have a great rest of the afternoon, everyone. And uh, hope everyone's doing well. Bye.